welcome to Heavy Metal, Hardware Solutions for People Who Digitize Tapes. You know who I am. I'm Ben Turkus. I work at the New York Public Library. I'm a member of Transfer Collective, but who are you? That's really an interesting question that I spent some time puzzling over as I was putting this together. Of course, I have no idea, but I am hoping that you are someone who has digitized a tape before in the past and that you have some baseline familiarity with the subject. I was thinking to myself, like, if my parents were attending this, what would they get out of it? And I hope they would get plenty and not be too lost. And so I hope the same for you as well. The goal in creating this educational resource was really to think about how to construct something that would both be a practical and a very specific guide to video and audio digitization. So we're going to focus on just a few formats, but hopefully I'll provide enough general context and tips and tricks that you can then apply to other contexts and scenarios for any type of media material that you might be digitizing. There are so many different ways to digitize media and there are so many different guides out there to how to do so. But what I wanted to show you is what I consider to be the most cost-effective way to achieve results that really rival the best of the best, what the best archives are doing and what the best digitization vendors are doing. Onto the agenda for the next 40, 45 minutes or so. When thinking about the equipment side of media digitization with this theme of streamlined but high quality setups in mind, this is what I came up with. Uh, number one, dismantling the rack. And I realized after starting to put this together that I may have let my own kind of hangups or preoccupations guide me here a little bit, but I've long felt that when I've gone to rooms that are filled top to bottom with all kinds of video equipment and really complex wiring configurations, whether I, when I was a student touring the Library of Congress or going to visit a vendor, I've long felt that these things were just so incredibly intimidating. And so what I really wanted to do today is break it apart, dismantle it, and think about trying to convey to you what the most important pieces of the puzzle are. And once you focus on those and you're mindful of these core pieces of equipment, the rest really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how pretty it is as long as you know what you're doing and you have some good gear on hand. I'll next talk about maybe the most important topic, determining what equipment you might need based upon your needs or desires. There is no one size fits all for media digitization. While I will name some names and really mention specific equipment that I like, just know that your mileage may vary. Part of doing this work is asking yourself, what do I care about? What does my institution care about? What can we live without? And I wouldn't rush through this part of the process and simply do what others are doing, because in all likelihood, there's no one correct answer. There's many ways to do the work. Another thing I want to emphasize throughout is that every hardware decision that you make has consequences, and at times downstream decision making can inhibit your upstream choices in consequential ways. So an example of this, you go out and buy a new M1 Mac mini computer because the computer you had been using for digitization is old and it no longer works with the new Mac operating systems that get released almost every six months, it seems. But the M1 Mac mini only has a Thunderbolt 3 port that it can use to power other devices. So you might also need to buy a different capture or digitization device to continue doing the work that you need to do. So I'll dig into this topic more as we go, but the bottom line is almost every hardware decision has the potential to create this ripple effect that will require other decisions to be made or other changes to be made. I'll then talk about how to find all of the stuff that you might need to build these streamlined setups, offering ideas for how to navigate online marketplaces and the people you might encounter there. And then I'll transition to putting the pieces together, uh, how to actually connect all of these different devices. And I'll use some simplified wiring diagrams that I put together to kind of walk you through the various possibilities. Finally, I'll wrap up with how to keep things up and running, how to find people who have the skills to repair all manner of obsolete equipment. So let's get right into it. What are the most important pieces of hardware in a digitization setup? And again, as I said, racks are not terrible things. I hope that I haven't overemphasized this. I was thinking dismantling the racks more in a metaphorical sense, I suppose. They come in all shapes and sizes. This one that you see on the left is at NYPL in the room next to mine. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. But again, I've always found them a little intimidating. So I really wanted to focus on the core piece of equipment and modular setups, things on wheels, things that you can move around and manipulate as you need to. But before I get into it, I just wanted to offer a quick digression on some important terminology that I might be using throughout. VCR or VTR, video cassette recorder or video tape recorder. I'll probably be using both somewhat interchangeably and just know that in general, VTR is typically privileged because it's more all encompassing. It includes open reel formats as well as cassette based formats. Digital video or DV. Now this one is a confusing one, but the 1990s gave rise to a number of digital video formats on tape. And DV, mini DV or DV cam is unique in that it's a compressed encoding written directly onto tape. 
And this is important because the way that we digitize DV isn't really digitization at all, right? We're simply migrating the data directly off the tape, and we're often using a firewire connection, an older computer connection. I'll show you what this looks like later. BNC, RCA, XLR, these are all audio and video connectors and sometimes are referred to as cables as well. And I'll talk about them more as I walk you through the different wiring diagrams. But this is kind of a useful shorthand to lock in on. BNC is a professional connector for video. RCA is a consumer video or audio connector. And then XLR is a professional audio connector. Finally, SDI or serial digital interface. And this is a big one, and I apologize if you get lost here, but I will explain it to the best of my ability. In 1989, the Society of Motion Picture Television Engineers, or SMPTE, created a standard for transmitting uncompressed digital video signals. And it's different than DV, which is an actual encoding. SDI is maybe best thought of as a non-encoded packets of raw digital video. It's really stable, and as this well-defined standard, it has a place for all kinds of things. So in this kind of video digitization world, we often refer to this stuff as ancillary data. It's things that could be hidden in the top of the video raster, things like time code, closed captioning, other types of metadata. SDI allows you to save all of this information. Also, critically, SDI allows you to embed your audio into your video signal, and you can transmit them both over one single cable. Now you can digitize tapes without going to SDI, but for me, getting a time-based corrector or TBC that can transform analog signals into SDI is really worth doing, in part because you retain this ancillary information, in part because you avoid lip sync issues. So if the audio and video are traveling separately all along, you can actually have some mismatches there that are very noticeable to the eye and ear. And then finally, and maybe most importantly, because the makers of capture hardware like Blackmagic, the company that I'll be talking about the most today, they privilege SDI in any number of ways. They don't really care as much about analog signals as they used to, even though they make devices that still can accept them. So again, it's a big topic, but I've got some diagrams later that will help explain some of this as we go. In terms of specific formats that I will be covering, I'm going to be talking about VHS, DV, mini DV, DV cam, and audio cassette. Now, we kind of chose these at random, but we chose them in part because they're the most common. And so hopefully, again, the advice that I give you will be somewhat applicable to other scenarios as well. And also worth noting, there are some important parts of this process that I won't have time to delve into, but I wouldn't overlook them if you're going about doing this work. So things like triage or intake, the separation of tapes based upon qualities one before you even begin digitization, very important stuff. Cleaning tapes, a very important topic. This is a cleaning machine made by RTI, very expensive, very hard to come by, a big glaring problem in the field, but cleaning media before you digitize it is really important. And so it's something to at least consider. Baking is a little bit more cost effective, something that you can achieve without spending tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, I've had a lot of luck with a food dehydrator, baking tapes that are suffering from different types of deterioration, either things like sticky shed syndrome or soft binder syndrome. So tapes over time start to break down. You pop them in a food dehydrator for 24 hours. You can get much better results. Another thing I wanted to emphasize is that for every format, you'll be presented with forks in the road. You have to make certain choices or the equipment that you have on hand will curtail certain choices. So essentially all formats are tricky and they have weird complexities that if you care about doing the work at the absolute highest possible level, you have to pay some attention to. So an example that I like to use, VHS, the people's format, it came in different flavors, right? Specifically, you could record at different speeds, something like two hours of standard play or SP, four hours of long play, less decent quality, or eight hours of crap quality, extended play, or super long play. So as with many aspects of VHS and Betamax as formats, this is a remnant of the format wars, right? That 70s and 80s battle for dominance between Sony, the maker of Betamax, and JVC, the maker of VHS. And once you understand that both companies were kind of locked in this desperate battle of one-upmanship, I'll let people record more content on a single tape. No, I'll, I'll see you that and I'll raise, or I'll allow people to record higher quality audio, hi-fi audio. Oh, I'll do the same. Once you understand this kind of back and forth, you'll begin to understand how tricky digitization can be if you're not careful and aware of all of these possibilities. And this matters because all VHS VCRs can't play back all speeds of VHS tapes. 
So specifically, the best professional VCRs, the ones that will produce the best image quality, often don't have the ability to play back long play or super long play or extended play tapes. And this makes sense if you really think about it. Professional broadcasters who were using these devices originally didn't record in that way. Recording in that way was more like me at home trying to cram as many Simpsons episodes onto a single VHS tape as I could. Again, your equipment will dictate your choices. And this is mostly a good thing. It's sometimes a bad thing. But ultimately, it's a powerful reminder of the importance of buying good gear and knowing its ins and outs. Hi-Fi audio, as I mentioned, in VHS and Betamax is another example of something that can be easy to overlook if you're not paying attention to it. And I included this little pinhole video here where you can actually see the Hi-Fi light popping on and off. This is from me adjusting the tracking on the VCR. And you would say, why is the audio coming in and out when you adjust the tracking. And that's because you have to understand that hi-fi audio, both in Betamax and in VHS, was actually recorded alongside the video signal. This was kind of the like ingenious revolution in that game of one-upmanship that I was talking about. So with hi-fi audio, you record the audio directly next to the video. You would continue to have linear audio recorded with a stationary audio head. So you ultimately end up with four different types of audio, four tracks, two linear and two hi-fi. And this is important because if you care about getting everything off the tape and you're trying to create that really authentic digital surrogate, you would need to set yourself up in such a way to make sure that you're capturing all four. Keep in mind though, that if you're transferring consumer tapes, long play, extended play, things of that nature, you might be using a device that doesn't offer four analog audio outputs, right? So you would have to choose one or the other, and your machine might make that choice for you. So again, it's all about knowing your equipment, deciding what you care about, and then planning accordingly. So circling back to the core pieces of equipment to pay the most attention to, I was very inspired by this resource that was put together by Ashley Bluer and others a few years ago, Minimal Viable Transfer Station Documentation. It's kind of a mouthful, but here's the link, and I have links at the end of the slideshow as well. It's really worth checking out. It kind of is a guide to different tiers of digitization setups, decent, better, best. But what I wanted to do today is really focus on the best. What would like a maximal viable transfer station look like, and what would it be composed of? It would be composed of the following things, a videotape recorder, VCR, duh, obviously. Determining the best model does vary by format. I'm going to give you some specific names, but really it's critical that you get a good one, that you get it serviced, that you have it in good shape. A time-based corrector or TBC, I talked about this a little bit. TBCs were really designed to correct all kinds of problems that can happen during playback from mechanical problems to tape deformation problems. So if you're playing back a tape and it looks funky, often a TBC will offer some stability and improve the quality of the image. It also allows you to control the actual video signal through what's called processing amplification controls. So you can adjust the whites, the blacks, or the color as needed. And TBCs are really critical in this way in digitization because they allow us to make sure that we're not losing any signal as we digitize, right? We avoid clipping or crushing of the signal. And again, the right late generation TBC, like the one I'm going to tell you a lot about today, will offer this ability to do an analog to digital conversion. So to take analog signals and transform them into SDI, which for me offers this host of benefits that I kind of alluded to earlier. Again, computers and capture cards are important parts of the puzzle. You can't do it without. And you want to make sure that you're making good decisions here, because as I said, computer choices, software choices, and capture card choices can create problems for you if you're not paying attention to all of the different possibilities. Finally, you'll need cables and connectors, uh, of course, and I'll talk about which ones you need. So let me break down what a digitization setup for VHS would look like. These are all really solid picks in my opinion. On the top left, a Sony SVO 5800 VCR. It's a professional VHS deck, produces really high quality image, offers four analog audio outputs, linear and hi-fi as I mentioned, has internal TBC and processing amplification controls. So you can actually control the video signal directly from the VCR. I would advise you to look for these and know that the price will vary depending. I think $1,200 is maybe on the low end, 17 is maybe on the high end. If this is too prohibitive for you, I'll show you a different option that would be something worth considering as well. The DPS 475 or 575, this is a time-based corrector made by Digital Processing Systems. It offers all of the features that I mentioned before. And if you look at this price range, $200 to $1,200 and say, what the hell is going on? Know that the price of this particular device has really skyrocketed in like recent years. It used to be that you could buy these for $100 on eBay easily. It's really not the case today. So again, you need to pay attention to what's going on in the marketplace. At the bottom here, you have a Blackmagic Ultra Studio HD Mini. It's a separate standalone capture device. I like it. I use it throughout the labs here at MYPL. And then finally, a computer. 
an M1 Mac mini from Apple costs about $699 these days. That is the low end, but it is a really powerful computer and offers more than enough to capture big analog video signals. Inside this video here, this little icon, uh, you'll see vRecord or a picture from vRecord. That's open source software that Archivist created that only works with Blackmagic hardware, but offers Archivists a whole amazing host of possibilities when it comes to video digitization. So for me, I love vRecord because of what it offers me here. Like you can see it offers live waveform monitor and vector scope. So I can monitor the signal in different ways as I'm capturing directly from my computer. Because I like vRecord so much, it forces me to use black magic hardware. So again, it's like one decision can lead to all these other choices. This is what this breakdown would look like just in text fashion. So an SVO 5600 or a 5800 for VHS tapes that are SVHS, the higher quality version of VHS tapes and standard play VHS. Again, it's got a solid transport, the internal TBCs, the balanced audio outputs. The difference between the 5600 and the 5800 is really trivial. 56 is a playback machine only. The 58 is a playback and an editing machine. That's not very relevant these days for digitization. It's more of like something that would be used when you were actually recording onto tape, but it is something to keep in mind. For long play and extended play or super long play tapes, I would recommend the Panasonic AG1980 or the Panasonic AG7350. Or if you want to stick with Sony, the Sony SVO. 1630 is a really great machine. I just bought two on eBay for about $200 each. These could be your only VCR if you choose. You know, if you want to have one thing that can handle all kinds of VHS tapes and you don't care about getting the absolute best possible looking video and you're fine doing without four channels of audio, this is a solid choice and I would recommend it. The DPS 475 or 575 for a time-based corrector. And importantly, you want to make sure you have the analog audio input option on it. If you look on eBay, some of them don't have this. And I'll show you what it looks like. You want to pay attention to make sure you buy that particular one. Again, it offers good stability and time-based correction. It allows you to do control the processing amplification, adjust the video signal. You can move the horizontal position. So sometimes the video raster is just a little off. You can make that adjustment. Uh, you can do all kinds of control of the audio levels. You can raise them, lower them. You can manipulate them in all kinds of ways. And most critically, as I've said a few times already, you can embed the audio in the video and send one signal directly into your capture card. Blackmagic Ultra Studio HD Mini, I talked about it. It's a good device. One thing to note is it only can be powered by Thunderbolt 3. So again, you buy that device, even if you have an old, if you have an old computer, it's not going to work. You need to buy a new computer with it too. So again, really pay attention to what's going on here. Turning to the kind of second main topic, determining your needs selection. How do you know what to buy? Obviously, you're here listening to me talk about what I like, but I'm only talking about a few specific formats. So there's a whole wide world out there. Here's some general advice that I would offer just in thinking through these questions. Again, most importantly, there is no one size fits all for AV equipment. Just because other people are doing something doesn't mean that it's necessarily the right thing for you. My general advice is learn from others, pay attention to how others are doing the work, review specifications on this website for a company that sells equipment, thebroadcaststore.com. I'll show you this in just a moment. Think about things like backwards compatibility. Can you buy a VCR that can play back a whole range of video formats? Uh, I'll show you an example in the Betacam family later on. Know that nothing is perfect. Even the equipment that I'm talking about today that I do truly like has problems. I'm going to talk about a few of those problems. So it's all about knowing those problems, anticipating them, and counteracting them before you even really have to deal with them. And then don't be afraid to go your own way. Knowing that prices vary, that prices can skyrocket when demand skyrockets, maybe you're better off trying to find another option. In terms of learning from others, this is a resource that I really love that I've gotten a lot out of. Uh, the team at the Stanford Media Preservation Lab have a website where they list all of the equipment that they use, both for audio and video. I'm just listing the video here, but they have a great list of audio equipment as well. And I've gotten so much out of this. The people who work at Stanford are really true experts in the field, Michael Angeletti and Jeff Willard. And this list here has been really helpful for me as I've added new formats to the mix. And I want to know what are others using? Like they do the research to really figure out how to make sure that they buy equipment that can do absolutely everything that you need it to do. So if you look here, you can see for VHS, they too use the SVO 5800 and a range of other VCRs. For long play and extended play tapes, they use the Panasonic AG1980, but also three or four different JVC models. And this is important to know, and just a general note, if you're trying to save money, obviously buy the one piece of equipment that you think will be best, but having options in video and audio digitization is always a really good thing. You never know when putting a tape on one VCR is going to play back looking like crap, and on another, it's going to be looking a lot better. And that goes from 
model to model, but also just within models. Sometimes like two VCRs of the same type will play back tapes slightly differently. Here's NYPL's version of the same thing. So I wanted to kind of pay homage to Stanford and in our GitHub documentation site, I listed out all of the equipment that we use and purchase. So it's very similar stuff and you can check out the link there as well. As I said, Broadcast Store is a really awesome reference for just learning more about different VCR formats. So I'm actually gonna escape and leave the Canva presentation for a second and just show you what I'm talking about. Here's the website for the Broadcast Store. And if I search for SVO 5800, for example, You'll see here like a bunch of different links. If I click on one of those links and I scroll down, they have this additional information section. And if you click on the link here, you'll see this isn't an operations manual and it's not a service manual, both important things that I'll talk about later. But this is kind of like a promotional brochure that Sony put together. And it is really useful because it tells you so much about this particular VCR. It tells you about the time-based corrector that's built in. It tells you about all of the video processing all of the audio processing, the linear and the hi-fi, as I mentioned before. It tells you that Dolby noise reduction is available on just the linear audio, but not the hi-fi. That was kind of news to me when I was looking at this just a few minutes ago. And then if you scroll down to the bottom, probably the most important thing to me, and I'll try to make this bigger, is you can see this specification document. And you'll see here, it kind of tells you a lot about how this VCR actually processes video and audio signals. So you can see your outputs, you have the choice between a composite output, this would be kind of the baseline level of quality, S-video, which would be slightly higher quality. I'll talk about the differences between these later on, and or component video. But important to note, for the component video output, you'll see that it requires this optional SVBK170 board. Now you go, what the hell is that? This VCR shipped without this board, and so you might get this VCR, think to yourself, I wanna use the component outputs, plug into them, but it's not gonna work. I'll also say just anecdotally, I've never actually seen an SVO 5800 with this board. As far as I know, it never really existed. And it's just kind of something I wanted to convey to you all. So again, Broadcast Store is a great place to look for all kinds of stuff. The Memory Lab Network, the kind of consortium of public libraries that build digitization stations for the public, it's a wonderful group and their website is so rich. It's got a tremendous amount of stuff that is really valuable if you're setting up your own digitization station. So they've got a vendor list, which you can actually see here. It includes people who fix things and people who sell things. They have tons of webinars that are definitely worth checking out. Topics like wiring, cleaning, et cetera. There's this goals and expectations form, which I really love, and which is kind of a good segue into our next section. It's really about figuring out what your needs are and buying equipment accordingly. And then there's this deep dive doc, and I highlighted it yellow here. It's long, it's extensive, but it's got tons of good information in it. I mentioned backwards compatibility earlier, and I just wanted to give you an example of this. So for Betacam tapes, they came in different flavors, right? And the technology started in the 1980s, but it kind of evolved over time. So you have standard Betacam tapes, you have Betacam SP, which is the higher quality, it came later, and you have digital Betacam, MPEG IMX, and HD Cam eventually. So it's basically 80s to like 2003 period, roughly. You can buy a single VCR that can play back that whole range of formats, but you would have to buy the right kind of VCR. So here's two examples. There's the Sony HDW M2000, which goes all the way to HD Cam, and then the Sony J30 SDI, which only goes up to MPEG IMX. The cool thing about the J30 is it's like tiny. It's compact, you can put it anywhere, you can leave it sideways. It's a very solid device. It has an SDI out, so you can literally just take the analog audio and video, take it straight out of the VCR into your capture card and have no problem at all. One thing to point out though, is that as with all things, there are pluses and minuses. The J30 is a great device, but it only plays back two channels of audio. So if you really care about all four, you would need to go with something like this HGW. Let's transition over to sourcing equipment, where to look for stuff, how to actually plot going about buying things, all of that good stuff, secondhand markets other than eBay, and then some trusted sellers. Again, knowing what equipment you want to buy and then how much you think you should be paying for it is kind of the primary thing to consider. I would say, again, check out the functionality of models on the Broadcast Store website. Don't be afraid to chart some new terrain. You know, Just because everyone else is using a certain VCR doesn't mean that you have to as well. Think about stockpiling gear because obviously things are getting more and more scarce and it's a kind of important part of the work to make sure that you'll be able to continue doing the digitization you need to. Knowing where to look for things is always a challenge, but there are people who sell stuff out there. 
Once you find them though, how can you actually go about buying them? And that's a tricky thing. And it really depends on your institution. I'm gonna offer some tips at the end about working that persuasion game for people on the procurement side to kind of convince them to help you do what you need to do to keep your digitization operation running. And I'm gonna talk a lot in just a second about eBay. So let's transition over to that. eBay is really the place to buy obsolete audiovisual equipment. There are other places, but eBay is really the number one. That said, eBay is really a roll of the dice and you never know what you're gonna get. So it's important to do the following things. Search in a variety of ways. So when I'm buying audio cassette decks, the one that I like to buy the most is the Tascam 122 Mark II or Mark III. Two different models, but they're very similar in nature. When I'm searching for them on eBay, one tip that I could offer is to search in different ways, right? Because people name things slightly differently. So if you search Tascam 122 MKIII, you might get different results than Tascam 122 MK3. You can use the save this search feature in eBay and they will email you notifications if equipment that you've searched for in the past becomes newly available. This is incredibly useful for the really rare stuff. And I would suggest figuring out how to do it. I had to Google it. I, I, it's something like what I just described, but it's a little bit more complicated. Always check out seller reviews. That's just an obvious thing. But if you have problems buying from eBay at your institution, you can always contact a seller and discuss the possibility of an off eBay purchase. Take a lot of time to review descriptions. This is really important stuff. So look for any specific mention of electronic or mechanical repairs. I think the more you look at listings, the more you can get a sense of people who actually know AV equipment and care about it. Look for words like refurbished. Look for words like new in box. Though a VCR that's been in a box for 30 years may be untouched in certain ways, but it may be broken in other ways. So keep that in mind. You know, Machines do break down even if they're not getting use. Look for mention of things like head hours or threading hours. So how long was the actual VCR in use? You can pull these up with menu options with a VCR that you have. And good sellers will actually tell you how many hours a machine uh, has seen use. eBay offers tax exempt status depending on the state that you live in. But I've saved a lot of money by going through the process of sharing with eBay the New York State tax exempt documentation that NYPL has. It is a bit of a painful process and it's a little tedious. And don't even get me started on trying to like email or contact the eBay legal department, but it's absolutely worth doing. And I would suggest doing so. And then three things to always be looking for when you're buying anything from eBay. The return policies, good to make sure you have one. Shipping costs, free would be ideal. And then if there's a warranty of any sort, that's also great. Craigslist is another option. It really does vary based upon your locale, but I wouldn't knock it. I found, for example, just by searching VCRs in New York City Craigslist, this listing for a Umatic VCR. I thought it was overpriced and it's not a model I would actually want to buy, but I was intrigued by this company in Chinatown that sold it. And it led me to this electronic supply store. And I ended up taking a TBC that I bought on eBay that arrived broken. I took it to them. They fixed it for not much money and I didn't have to send it anywhere. And it was actually a really easy process. So, you know, you never know what you can find just by getting out there, digging deep, and then trying to make connections with random people. It's really kind of the name of the game. Transitioning over to sourcing the rest of it, right? So you figured out the VCRs you want to buy or the tape decks you want to buy. You found them on eBay or elsewhere. And now you have to figure out all the other stuff. How do you go about doing it and where can you find it? I think the primary thing to talk about really are cables, connectors, and other miscellaneous equipment. First thing I'll say is the Cable Bible. It's another EMEA open source website. I have a link at the end. It's put together by Ethan Gates. It's a wonderful resource. It's comprehensive. It has almost any AV cable and connector, and it tells you how they operate and what you need to do to use them. When you're capturing video, and you're using BNC cables or coaxial cable, you have to pay attention to the difference between 75 and 50 ohm impedance. Now it's a complicated electrical subject that I don't really know a lot about, but I would say that 75 ohm impedance is really what you want because it prevents signal loss or distortion. So when you're buying cables from different places, make sure you're looking for 75 ohm or digital video coaxial or BNC cable. All kinds of tools you might need to do the work. Think about buying things like screwdrivers, drills, wire cutters, crimpers, adapters of various sorts. I think if you're doing a lot of VHS, you'll wanna buy BNC to RCA adapters, and I'll show some pictures in a minute. And then think about your electrical situation. Getting a power conditioner or uninterrupted power supply, UPS, this is a really critical piece of the puzzle. I'm not gonna get into it anymore, but I'd be happy to talk about it more with you offline. This drill, I have to do a shout out for, we bought this drill recently. It's a DeWalt hand drill. It's $89. It's great for opening tapes. It's great for opening VCRs. It's got this like gyroscope. So when you twist your hand one way or the other, it kind of tightens or loosens. It's just fantastic. And I love it. 
And then there are other supplies you might need. Low lint cotton swabs, so low lint Q-tips. I like these MG chemical ones that you can find on Amazon and elsewhere. 99% isopropyl alcohol for cleaning inside your tape machines. You want 99% because it dries faster. Tex wipes, TX304. Again, you can find those online by Googling. Cotton wipers that are low lint and low nap as well. You might need splicing blocks and or splicing tape. It's always good to have blank tape stock. And then think about remote controls. For certain VCRs, a remote control is the only way you can control certain menu options. So if you're buying a, a VCR on eBay and it has a remote, that's a good bonus. Sources for all of this miscellaneous stuff. B&H Photo Video in New York is really a big behemoth of a company. And I think they do business with everyone cross country. They offer really great nonprofit discounts. They have all kinds of stuff you might need. They ship quickly, but the company has a really long and terrible history of labor practices. And if you Google it, you can find out a lot that is quite unsavory. So I would say, do what you can, follow your own moral compass, but it's just something to keep in mind. There are all alternatives out there. Adorama, MarkerTech, DigiKey, and Mouser. These companies sell most anything you could possibly need. So, you know, if you're uncomfortable with B&H, this is another good option. Don't forget about test tapes and don't buy a VCR on eBay or a tape deck on eBay and then pop in something important without first putting in a test tape. Test tapes come in different shapes and sizes. On the right here, you'll see like a very high quality test tape that Do Art put together. Do Art was a film and video production house in Manhattan. And the video engineer who worked there, Maurice Schechter, was one of the best in the business, is one of the best in the business. And he took what you can see here, a Sony Umatic alignment tape something that's very hard to come by. And he made his own one generation copy of it for the new museum. And this is a really nice thing to have because you know it's an incredibly trustworthy test tape with real high quality test signals. Uh, but if you can't find this sort of thing, I would definitely advise buying some commercial things like on the left, this Lord of the Dance tape. I use this all the time at work. It's got linear and hi-fi audio. I pop it in to make sure everything's wired correctly. I know what it should look like. I know what it should sound like. So have some test tapes of whatever kind you can actually get your hands on. Okay, let's uh, transition over to putting the pieces together, how to actually wire these things once you've purchased them and you have everything you need. Again, just a quick review. Analog signals come in a few flavors. There's composite video in which all of the video information, the Luma or the black and white and the color are all on one single channel or cable. There's S video known as separate video. And this is an improvement over composite video you actually have the video split in two and you have the Luma, the black and white information on one kind of set of pins and the chroma on another set of pins. It's still one cable S video, but there are different pins. And you can see here in this kind of 10 commandment, this is an S video cable. And you can see the different pins carry the different signals and keep them separate, even though there's still one cable. So it's higher quality, but it's not as high quality as component video or YPBPR in which you split it into three, right? You have the Luma or the black and white information, and then you have two chroma channels, two color channels, PB and PR. This is the highest quality signal that you can send analog. But again, it all depends on the equipment that you have. It may not be an option for you. This is what these things look like in cable form. Again, composite video, it can be transferred over RCA or BNC cables. That's the first one here. S-Video is always transferred over this mini DIN four pin cable, which you can see here. And sometimes you have these mini DIN four pins to YC adapters. Now this could come in handy and would be worth buying depending on your setup. Component video like composite video is commonly transferred over both RCA or BNC cables. And these are some pictures of what they look like. Component video has this color coding, green, blue, and red. Composite video has slightly different color coding, yellow, red, and white. The red and white in that case would be the audio channels, the left and the right. So let's look at what putting the pieces together would actually look like for a consumer or prosumer VCR, VHS VCR. This is a Panasonic AG1980, a DPS 575 TBC, and the Blackmagic Ultra Studio Mini. You could send your one composite cable over BNC into the time-based corrector. You could send your two RCA audios into the Phoenix connector, which is the analog audio input terminal block on the back of the 575. And then you can send one SDI signal that contains both, it's digital, into the ADD converter. So it's already been digitized, but it goes in the ADD converter and gets encoded. So think of it not as much of an ADD converter as kind of an input output device. And then from there, it goes into the computer. Here's what these little adapters look like. You might need something like this, which would be RCA to BNC or BNC to RCA.
Quick digression, definitely check out a workshop that Morgan Morrell at the Bay Area Video Coalition put together specifically about the 575 DPS TBC and using these analog audio terminal blocks. You will have to do some cutting of cables. You will have to do some soldering. You will have to use a multimeter possibly, but I promise you it's really not hard. And this hour long uh, webinar is so useful and absolutely worth checking out. He walks through how to do this with XLR cables, the professional audio cables, and he walks you through how to do this with RCA, the consumer. Highly, highly, highly love this video. Cannot recommend it enough. If we were transitioning from a consumer VCR to a professional VCR, this is what a setup could look like. We're still using composite video out of the back of our SVO 5800, but we're capturing both the linear and the hi-fi audio by sending all four channels into the TBC in the same way. And because SDI is the best, you can send out that one signal that contains the video and all four audio channels directly into the capture card. If you're thinking to yourself, well, how can I improve the quality here? You could use the S video output on the SVO 5800. As we said, S video is better than composite video. And it would look very similar just using that mini DIN four pin, same audio setup going into the computer. So you think, yes, this is great. I'm improving things, but it gets complicated. The thing to know is that the 575 TBC, the S-Video encoder, has some issues with it. And these were caught only recently by Morgan and other people. And so, as I said, pluses and minuses to all pieces of equipment. And it's really most important that you just know these things and you can adjust accordingly. This is also a shout out for a new extension of the AV Artifact Atlas, a great resource for visualizations of analog and video errors. We're trying to build something new called AV Kid. Audiovisual Known Issues Database, a clearinghouse for equipment-related issues that people know about. It's a work in progress. It doesn't quite exist yet, but if you'd like to contribute to it, please let me know. We'd love more people involved. For the S-Video encoder of the 575 TBC, you'll see here, this is not as it should look. I don't have time to really get into it anymore, but the ninth and 10th bit planes of the video, of digital video created by the S-Video encoder are not right. And so you think, well, I'm improving the quality with S-Video, then you're losing quality with this S-Video encoder. So again, it might be better to go back to just using composite, pluses and minuses to all things, as I said. Another option, if you wanted to avoid this S-Video issue, would be to use a different capture device and not use the 575 TBC. So here's what a setup would look like using an AJA H10 AVA. Uh, so that's your ADD converter and you would use S-Video and you would use an S-Video splitter to YC and go in there. And then you would wire your four analog audio channels in. And then if you still wanted to use V-Record because you care about that, you could send the SDI, pass it through the Blackmagic and still use V-Record. You could in this context, skip Blackmagic altogether and just go AJA into your computer. But you know, it all depends on what you prefer. For DV, for digital video, as I said, it's a whole different ball game. You really can just migrate the data directly off the tape. I like this Sony HVR M35U or the M25U. The M15U is also great, uh, but there are so many DV VCRs out there. And I have a link at the end to the DV Rescue Project that actually lists out all kinds of DV VCRs. So I would check that out before buying any DV VCR. But to capture in this way, to migrate the data off, you would use a variety of cables. You would use a Firewire cable, four pin to eight pin. You would use a Thunderbolt two to Thunderbolt three adapter or a Firewire to Thunderbolt adapter, and then a Thunderbolt two to Thunderbolt three adapter. What's cool about this is it actually works with all these different dongles. It's kind of remarkable. And again, this is Mac only. If you're using Dell computers or other PCs, I could talk to you about different options. But this is a really easy, great thing. And it's a good segue to talk more about the DV Rescue Project. So this is an NEH grant that was arranged by uh, Moving Image Preservation of Puget Sound. It's a great group at, out in Seattle and they built new software tools for capturing DV. I can direct you to all kinds of people who would talk more about it, but it's definitely worth checking out. For audio cassette, it's a little bit different. You can get ADD converter like this one, the Motu Ultralight MK5. I like it. It offers good kind of bang for the buck. The quality is high. And you would do something similar. You would get your XLR to quarter inch cables which you could buy from b &H or elsewhere, you would send them into the ADD converter. Here's two cassette decks wired, and then you could just go USB-C into the computer. Important when you're buying audio cassette decks to look for things like this. You wanna make sure that they can play all the different tape types that are out there. So type one, type two, type three, and type four audio cassettes. And you wanna make sure that they can do Dolby noise reduction. 
Ideally, also you would have azimuth adjustment. The Tascam 122 Mark II or III offers all of these things. Here's a different version of this. And I know I said I'm anti-rack, but this is something I just built at work. Six audio cassette decks going into an Orion AD converter. More expensive, it's about $2,500. But this is really wonderful. It offers 32 different inputs. So I can actually have different cassette stations on wheels all wired into this one ADD converter and we can capture 12, 16 tapes at once. Briefly, let's talk about equipment repair. Here are some specific people who I like for repair. But again, the work is really in finding others and forging connections and making relationships. Bob Schuster, Midnight Bob is in the Newark area. He comes on site, but he also will accept equipment from anywhere in the world. Thomas Vo in Texas is a great Sony repair technician. He is awesome. I've been working with him a lot recently. And then Ken Zinn in California. He was trained by the US Army. He worked for Memorex and other companies. He can do everything. He also sells equipment and he is really, really top notch. He also sells belt kits. So if you have a VCR like a Umatic that needs a tune up in that way, you can buy a belt kit and instruction manual for him and do the work yourself. But there are many other people out there. Here are some resources that I like. The Smithsonian put together a list of different vendors and the Memory Lab Network, as I said, has an equipment sourcing list. Check out both of these if you have time. And then general other repair advice, collect as many manuals as you can. You need operations manuals, you need service manuals find them, get them. You need to forge relationships. I look for help on different listservs like Amia L, the quad list or old VTRs. You can find different names of repair people. You can find service manuals here and then keep track of your equipment. You can list things. You can get a spreadsheet, a database. You can use David Bowie stickers like I did at Bayvac. Uh, it's just good to know what equipment is what and keep track of it. In terms of overcoming institutional barriers, this is the topic I'm going to leave you on. And again, it's a really hard one and it's challenging. All I can say is persistence is key. And I've had some success following these kinds of approaches, getting a purchasing card. So some institutions allow you to use a credit card and you can maybe follow less stringent rules for purchases. That's been the only way at the library that I've been able to use eBay, but it's been really a godsend. Third party buyers. So if eBay is a no-go, if P cars aren't an option for you, you could try buying from someone who might be able to buy from some of these other sources. So the Mid-Atlantic Regional Moving Image Archive or Marmia, headed by Siobhan Hagen, has signaled an openness to this idea. So you, as your institution, would contract with Marmia. You would talk to Siobhan or whoever about the equipment you want to buy. They would buy it, maybe mark it up. I don't know. And then you could actually get what you need. Also, making connections. And this is really key. So people on the procurement side may or may not really understand the work that we do and really taking the time to talk to them, explain to them what we do. I think people implicitly understand that equipment is obsolete in the AV world and you need to find these things from weird places. So just telling them this over and over again can really get you a good amount of the way there. So I'll leave you with some resources. Email me if you have questions. Thanks again. Thank you all.